Okay, no problem. Okay, so this course, the syllabus is here, uh, will be on advanced topics or quantum two, as uh, it's commonly known from the Chris Point course downtown, right? So <coughs> I'm Artur Ismailov, and uh, here there's some information, the place where lectures uh, will take place and uh, office hours. They will be in the morning on Wednesdays, right? So you can drop by my office. It's a new building right there, or I don't know whether I'm pointing in the right direction, but uh, behind the uh, instructional center, there is a new chemistry building. It's called ESCB or EV, uh, yeah. So I'm on the third floor. Uh, please drop by. Um, I highly encourage that because any sort of communication will be useful. Quantum mechanics is a difficult subject. And uh, I don't know, better way just talking about it and uh, well, doing it, and then maybe you will get the sense that you understand something. All right? <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but if you, if you feel stressed out or troubled with some concepts, please come. We'll talk. Maybe it will go away. Maybe not. We'll see. All right? Uh, highly encourage. Uh, come in. Okay, and then there is a marking scheme there, mm, kind of a normal way. Usually the undergraduate courses are going, the homeworks 20%, midterms 45, final exam 45. So <coughs> some of them, like maybe midterm will be uh, take home, uh, OC, closer to the uh, midterm. And then to pass, you need to pass either midterm or final and receive final grade 50 plus. All right, so the course description goes as follows. Okay, so we will start with reviewing some basic postulates, concepts, essentially the summarizing quantum one, uh, it's like what you, what you remember, it will be highly dependent on your input today. Like uh, I will start asking some questions, some basic questions and we'll see what material do I need to I'll kind of explain again? Uh, so that will be a review today, mostly. Uh, starting with postulates, Schrodinger equations, uncertainty relation, measurements, so on and so forth. Uh, then, probably next time, we will start uh, investigating approximate methods. Because the way I see quantum mechanics in general, it has like a first part postulates postulates and formalism right then second what you usually study in quantum one you consider some model systems like particle in the box harmonic oscillator uh, chemist study I think physicist as well hydrogen atom and uh, well essentially exactly solvable problems right where the Hamiltonian allows you to solve eigenvalue problem for the time independent Schrodinger equation. Yes, so model. Sorry. Model uh, problems. And then that's pretty much it for our first introductory course in quantum mechanics, right? Now the trouble with to kind of stop here is that uh, unless you use knowledge, it's usually get forgotten, right? So, and with this, there is not much use actually. So from this, you learn that quantum mechanics is quite quite counterintuitive and uh, difficult. Formalism, mathematical formalism, is uh, operating with functional spaces, infinite dimensions. So. It is more complicated than the normal classical mechanics in some cases. Uh, and then model problems, they are useful to kind of see some of this basic behavior, like probably two level systems, some, some discrete levels uh, and uh, features in dynamics or uh, I guess light matter interaction can be understood based on the model problems. but. In the real problems, you usually encounter cases where you cannot solve uh, Hamiltonian uh, or time independent Schrodinger equation exactly. So then, then there is no use of all this anymore. And uh, that's why what becomes important is to learn approximate methods.
which are perturbation theory and variational approach, those are not the only one, but two basic ones. Uh, so on these days, people, of course, use more sophisticated approaches, uh, like renormalization group theory and uh, other just Green's function approaches. Uh, but these two, if you don't know them, then it's really even hard to well, start reading literature on more advanced, because they form the language of uh, how, think, uh, how people think about the complicated problems. Uh, where you have usually some parts of the problem where it's exactly solvable, but there is a part that makes problem non exactly solvable. And uh, then perturbation theory allows you at least to start understanding how this uh, well, extra part modifies the physics of the problem. And variational approach also kind of uh, does similar tricks, but uh, in a different way, essentially. It can learn from the exactly solvable way how to form the ansatz for a wave function and then uh, formulate the equations on the parameters that you want to adjust because the problem is not exactly solvable but to account for the, the parts that make problem difficult. Okay, so then we will uh, move on to many body problems where not only one particle but more than one particle is present. Those are uh, well, quite common in chemistry, in biophysics, molecules is kind of very simple example where you have well, several electrons, right? So the only molecule that has one electron is H2+, plus, exactly solvable again, so not that interesting, right? But the uh, simple real neutral molecule is probably H2, and that already has two electrons. So how to incorporate well, many body physics and how to uh, solve, yeah. Did you say that H2 plus is solvable? Yes, it is. Okay. It's one electron problem, cylindrical, uh, it uses cylindrical symmetry of the problem, uh, okay. right? So for the, it's solvable though for a fixed nuclei, okay? Right. So that, that's a important correction <laughs> because for general case where you have everything moving, uh, I'm thinking more now, I guess, as a chemist because in, we we'll see that um, in this topic of adiabatic uh, representation, uh, that uh, one kind of useful concept is the time scale separation or energy scale separation. And then if you have in your system particles that move in fast, uh, electrons or electron in this case, and particles that are move, move slower, like nuclei, because they have a heavier masses, right? Then you can split the problem uh, and generate the solution for the problems which are not real, say frozen nuclei, and use those solutions to build the solutions of a full problem, and that's called adiabatic uh, representation, where we use to represent more complicated problem, uh, somewhat simpler problem, but that is still useful uh, because we know how to glue the simple solutions into the full solution, right? So the H2 plus, uh, I'm not sure we're gonna consider that in details, but uh, generally it's an example where if you fix nuclei, since it's a one electron problem with a lot of symmetry, you can solve it exactly, right? Now there is a symmetry aspect uh, of quantum mechanics, very useful because just to give you a simple argument for studying symmetry, it essentially allows you to say which integrals are zero and which are not, right? So very useful thing, especially in the context of perturbation theory, where you have, say, we'll see that, that you know the solution of um, H0, and then you add perturbation, and that's your problem, right? And you build the, say, H psi, E psi solution for the full problem as a, some linear combination of, uh, zero Hamiltonian wave functions. And these coefficients, they depend on the matrix elements of, uh, say, the zero order functions with the perturbation. Right? So they're proportional. Now this is the integral where you have function v, function of x, say, and this guy is a function of x. And so to understand whether this integral is um, 
uh, non-zero, whether these functions uh, or through this perturbation affect the, the outcome. You can use symmetry a lot and say, uh, well, investigate which levels are coupled and which, yeah. And when you say symmetry, so you, you mean group theory? Like I see point yeah. groups? Yeah, okay. that's right, yeah. Because uh, in the case of molecules, for example, you have say, simple molecule H2, right? You have uh, D infinity H symmetry. All right, so if you again fix the nuclei and solve the, for the electrons, right? So then you can have an infinite uh, uh, order loop, uh, not loop, but uh, axis that uh, axis of symmetry in uh, the cylindrical problem, right? So there will be. Uh, well, the main point is that the group operations, group operators, right? They will all commute with the Hamiltonian of the problem. And if they commute, they have eigenfunctions which are uh, the same for the Hamiltonian and for these uh, operations, op operators, right? And then you can use that information to construct the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, constraining them to be the eigenfunctions of the group operator, which are easier to find than the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, right? So as again, it's reducing uh, the complexity of the problem. Uh, Say if you ask for directions, someone points this way, so you don't need to search for this part of the space. You, you go that way, assuming that the directions are right, so then later you can kind of uh, on your own find uh, the final destination. But these uh, symmetry points, they are very important because they uh, allows you to reduce the complexity of non, exactly non-solvable problems. Uh, so for numerical procedure, there will be a less uh, space to uh, well, essentially search through. Okay, so that's the main use of symmetry. If you can find the, the symmetrical elements that commute with the Hamiltonian, that restricts uh, wave functions of the Hamiltonian to be of certain symmetry. Yeah. All right, and then we will talk at the end uh, about the spectroscopy, that's more related uh, to the, well, I guess more related, was related to the chemical audience. Uh, that's how we probe the molecules, but uh, for this audience, maybe we will change this to, well, depending on your interest. Uh, I, I heard from you that you are interested in relativistic uh, aspects. Uh, do you have any interest? Maybe you could tell me later, right? So if you have any particular advanced topics we want to, you, you want us to kind of dwell into or cover maybe or connect with the basic formalism, we can consider that as well. So please take advantage of the fact that it's just two of you. <laughs> maybe there will be more joining later, but uh, right now it's, uh, it's almost like a series of Workshops or so, something. Online? Yeah. So I feel like there are several students who are just gonna, you know, watch at home and never actually come to lecture. You know? Yeah, maybe. But then, uh, since you are here, you are, uh, yeah, you can, you can rule the show, right? So. <laughs> this is also true. All right. So that's uh, that's the approximate list of topics that I want to cover, and uh, as I said, today we'll start with review. Let me just take this off the. Green. By the way, any questions so far? No? So that, straight. That H, with the H, what does that H stand for? Uh, it stands for the plane perpendicular to the uh, okay, axis, yes, yeah. Okay. Right, we'll cover that. So it just was uh, one example. All right, so what do you remember as the kind of a main postulates of a quantum mechanics? Uh, so what is this subject all about? <laughs> the physics of things smaller than an atom? I don't think that's the answer you're looking for. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty close, yes. But uh, how, do we, how do we start describing uh, this physics? Uh, we introduced this object psi, right, which is... Uh, as a function of x and t, right, the space and time, right, and what what does it really mean? Uh, does it have any meaning? Uh, this psi? Why do we introduce it? 
it allows us to calculate the probabilities of the quantities of our particles. Our particles. Mm -hmm. All right, so the, well, the psi square, right? The psi square is a probability density. Yes. Okay. So what does that mean? What's the difference between probability density and uh, probability? So the point here is that if you, if you make this psi square, absolute square, it will still be a function of x and t, right? Our probability is a number, like uh, when you throw a dice between 1 and 6, right? With probability 1, one 6, right? You get uh, some number. This one is a function of space and time. And say to get the, say you have a quantum particle in uh, some kind of box, right? From zero to one, oops. Then to ask, well, to answer the question, where is your particle? What you can do is to find the probability of a particle being in the, say, some range between A and B, A, B, right, which is equal to the integral from A to B, and then you have psi square dx, okay? Now this probability, we integrated all space variables, right? So the probability is actually a function of time if we start it with a function that is a function of space and time, right? And so <coughs> probability density, because uh, itself, it can be larger than zero, or, well, larger than one uh, easily, because probability can be, probability density can be higher than one in the relatively small range, right? Uh, but if you integrate, uh, you can get still something between 0 and 1, right? So it's always between 0 and 1. And it can oscillate in time, okay? So the first postulate essentially says that we, we need this object, right? And, uh, well, one easy way to, to see why we need this object is this so called double slit experiment where you kind of observe both particle and wave uh, behavior if you shoot, All right? So you get some interference picture, which quite interesting from the classical perspective if you think about it. Like even if you shoot a single electron at a time, then you still get this picture uh, classically, you would think that it goes either for one or for another, right? And if you, say, imagine uh, someone is shooting bullets, right? And uh, you attach somewhere here uh, to the wall. And the friend of yours will say, okay, I'll make your life easier, and I'll just make another hole. I right? will say, what, are you crazy? That there's a, like, doubling chances that yeah, I'll be shot by the bullet. Right? But in the quantum world, that actually, oh, he says, okay, that's, that's all fine because you will be in this destructive interference region where the probability will be zero, right? So it's only possible in the quantum world because actually this wavelengths uh, of the this destructive interference and constructive interference regions, they're very small, tiny, essentially. Right? All right. You guys also for PSCD 50? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. I was thinking with this the other day. Yeah. Is it possible to set up like a two dimensional Schrodinger equation with like a certain potential and, and solve yeah. that? Or would you have to do it analytically? No. We actually, I don't know whether you heard about this uh, hackathon that uh, yeah. Anna Rain uh, did, right? So, with a student of mine, you, you may know him, Joey. Uh, Joe, yeah. Yeah, right? So he is uh, working in my lab on solving quantum, like some simple model problems, right? And what we did with him, essentially, we put the barrier and made the propagation numerically of the wave function starting with some kind of wave packet. And we observed this double slit experiment in MATLAB code. So you can generate that. 
And uh, I can show you next, uh, next lecture the simulations there somewhere and on <laughs> my computer. And uh, you can actually see what's the wavelength and uh, what's the distance between these uh, guys. And of course, that all depends on the momentum. That's uh, related to De Broglie wavelength. The momentum of the particle is usually uh, quite large and uh, well, or small in the classical terms because the masses are small, right? And the uh, velocities are large. Uh, yeah, so the distances are also small. Now, with this, uh, if we if we just think about this classically again. And if you sprinkle water, right, through the double slit, then there is nothing really surprising because the water would kind of interfere, behave like a uh, well, wave. But we know why water behaves that way, because water has many particles and they go uh, up and down in the different phases and uh, then two waves can constructively or destructively interfere. Now, what was really surprising, I guess, in whole physics, of this phenomena is that uh, it's a single electron that behaves that way. So it's almost like the electron has a kind of composite structure that, well, there are little sub-electrons would uh, make this interference possible. But, well, we know the best of our knowledge, the electron is a single particle. So, and that single particle behaves that way so that we need to introduce the object wave function that. Uh, describe the behavior of this electron, elementary particle. And not only electron, but other particles as well. Right, so that, the, that is the first postulate. We need to do that. Now, <coughs> natural question and if appears right away. OK, so we got this psi. Uh, how do we, well, what's the use of it? And uh, what properties can we obtain? And how can we obtain psi itself, right? Where, do, where does it come from? Okay. Do you know the answer? Where does psi come from? How do you obtain psi? Eigen functions that I have something. Mm -hmm. At least in a simple sense. Okay. Any any other answers? Okay. You guys? Uh, did you take any introductory course in quantum mechanics? Yes. Yeah. Uh, which one? Uh, so you're from UTSC, right? Yeah. So are those are B56 and C56? Yeah. OK. All right. So yeah, you, you, you are the closest to the truth uh, here that uh, psi comes from Schrodinger equation, but we have two, time dependent and time independent, right? Also, you mentioned something about eigenvalues, eigenvectors, uh, eigenfunctions, right? So uh, that is further from the truth because as we, we talked in the beginning, uh, that this time-dependent Schrodinger equation is the most fundamental in the context of isolated systems, quantum systems. And that equation uh, describes, well, essentially gives you an uh, equation on psi. Now, let's consider that equation. So this H is an operator, right? So have you seen this operator before? All right. Now, can you tell me what it is, generally, for any? Just a form or just a word? Well, as precise as possible for a general system. Uh, negative h bar squared over two m times the Laplacian plus the potential energy function. Laplacian of what? Of the wave function. Sorry, it's just as an operator. Oh, but Laplacian is a second derivative uh, with respect to what variables? Of the space, like x, y, z, if you want to call them like this. Uh -huh. But not time. OK. Well, this is uh, more specific than we actually need, because what I was thinking about, t plus v, right? So this kinetic yeah. plus potential energy. And the kinetic energy, you're right, can be um, described, as you, as you said, as minus h bar uh, squared divided by 2m Laplacian, right? But this is too specific because, first of all, if you have more than one particle, you have several terms like that. And if they have different masses, there will be different masses, right? So, but to be well, very simple, for 1D case where there's only one x variable, right, then 
this thing is really uh, just a minus h bar divided by 2m. This stays there and uh, d2 over dx squared, right? So this is a differentiation with respect to space variable. And then potential part is some function of x. It can also be a function of x and t, right? And this is a very important case because if it's only a function of x, then we, in this case, we can formulate uh, also time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay? And now uh, I will kind of discuss this a little bit more once we're well, somewhat done with the time dependent part. Uh, this cannot be done when you have a dependence in the, uh, in the potential on time, okay? So this is only a case where H is an operator that acting on X, okay? That is a very important thing to remember. Uh, so this time-independent Schrodinger equation is more restrictive than time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay, now everyone knows how to kind of build H. You can, well, for simple systems, you can build H for classical system, right? And then turn it into the quantum operator by, uh, well, going from uh, T classical plus V classical, right? And the quantization rules are relatively straightforward in uh, Cartesian coordinates. Right, so you just substitute P, say Px, by minus Ih bar d over dx, right? And uh, V and the x goes to x, right? Nothing surprising there, right? And the kinetic energy is always uh, P squared divided by 2m for the classical particles. V is depending on your problem, right? So you can formulate this operator. Formulation of the Hamiltonian actually is one of the simplest parts of the quantum mechanics, right? Because uh, most of the problems you can just uh, uh, well, take, a, take a, any books on, on the quantum mechanics and they will tell you how to formulate the Hamiltonian for your specific problem. It's relatively easy and straightforward. We will, uh, when we will start discussing molecules, I will uh, well, just generalize this to molecules, but it's very straightforward. Now, solving that is more difficult, right? Because it's a differential equation, uh, has uh, time derivatives and space derivatives. It's a double differentiation with respect to space and uh, uh, first differential with respect to time, right? So, but still, solving this problem, if your uh, potential is only space dependent, relatively straightforward. Uh, what you can do as just uh, considering this as a first order differential equation in time, right? For now, uh, we can just uh, well, use the first order kind of intuition and uh, write that psi xt is exponent of minus i h bar t divided by h bar uh, i h hat t divided by h bar acting on psi x zero. Right? Where does this come from? We can see the Hamiltonian as a, just a number, right? Instead of thinking it as an operator, we consider it as a number. And if you uh, would have something like k um, y function of t equals to, I'll say alpha y dot t, right? Then you know how to solve this equation, right? So you, you would just do k divided by alpha y equals 2 dy over dt, right? Then you separate variables, right? And then k alpha dt on one side and then dy over y on the other side, right? And then you get logarithm of y uh, times t and then equals to 
from 0 to t, k divided by alpha, t, 0 t, right? So then you exponentiate. Right? Very simple. Now the same thing can be done here because your h is not t dependent. Right? Uh, the trouble though is that h is an operator. How do you take the exponent of the operator? Potentially you can, but that question of how do you take the exponent of the operator requires some, well, resolution, okay? Any ideas? Uh, could we use its eigenvalues? Mm -hmm. I, I'm just thinking about what we did before. Mm -hmm. Like, instead of writing it like that, we would say that the general wave function is a sum with the appropriate coefficients, and there's an infinite number of them. And then instead of, and that, that would be in front of that exponential. Mm -hmm. And then instead of having the Hamiltonian as an operator, we have the eigenvalues, like the energy mm -hmm. of the Hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah. That, that would work too, but that would work, okay. <laughs> that would work why? Um, well, what we <laughs> used that for was because we use separable uh, solutions. Like we assume that the wave function could be written as a product mm -hmm. to find the solution in the first place. Mm -hmm. and just from the math, you know, the general solution has to be mm -hmm. uh, a linear combination of, of the individual solutions. So it was, it was basically a mathematical like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, here's uh, it, it's it's all it's all math too because, well, really the exponent you can just do the Taylor series expansion, right? So the exponent of a, where a is an operator, you can always write as a plus a square two plus a three divided by six, and so on and so forth. A n n factorial plus Right, so this is just a Taylor exp uh, series expansion, right? Why is this making our life easier? Because really we know how to take a power of the operator. Because taking power of operator a square is really just acting with the operator a twice, right? Now, we come to important uh, well, consideration is that if we know psi of x0 as a linear combination of these guys, phi ants, which are, well, I wrote them more like this, which are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, right? Then what do we know about eigenfunctions? Why eigenfunctions are so convenient? Yeah, what? Okay. That's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> the, answer, the answer I'm looking for is written here. Right. So just let me remind you what, what the operator is. Just uh, how do we think about operator? Why is it why is it complicated quantity? Because what it does, it takes a function and produces another function. Right, generally. So the simplest operator they probably taught you is d over dx, differentiation, right? And so then you have a simplest function, x squared, you get 2x, right? So if you plot this two, one is parabola, and then you act it with the operator, it uh, is very kind of different, it's linear function. Now, what operator did, it modified the function, uh, but the eigenfunctions, eigenfunctions. What is the what are the eigenfunctions for this guy? Yeah. So the exponents of alpha x, right? The eigenfunctions, and when this guy is acting on them, so it will produce alpha exponent alpha x, right? So what was the modification? Just a constant, right? 
And this constant can be 1, can be well, some other constant, right? So the shape of the function will not change, right? So you, you give operator a function, it returns back the same function just multiplied by a constant. That's why on the set of eigenfunctions, action of operator is the simplest you can get, right? Think about it, right? So it's, a, it's the simplest action of the operator on the object you give it. Right? That's why we, well, we love eigenfunctions for the reason that, first, any function, any function psi x0 can be expanded as a linear combination. That's what I wrote here, right? As a linear combination of uh, eigenfunctions, Hamiltonian in this case, right? But generally, uh, it goes back to this measurement theory, uh, and we'll talk about this in a moment. So, in quantum mechanics, you have all the all, all the properties that uh, could interest you potentially map to the operators corresponding to them, right? Energy is mapped to what? Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian. Then momentum is mapped to well, this this p guy. Where is it? Well, this here guy the p guy, and then kinetic energy is mapped to this operator, potential energy mapped to, well, say, for harmonic oscillator, this function, right? So, and the angular momentum has its own operator. Every property, so if someone asks how to calculate this property, first thing you think is what's the operator, right? Now, the next step is if you, di if you have some function, initially, only space dependent, then in order to well, understand how operator acts on that function, one way is just to expand it in eigenfunctions of that operator. Okay? Then all the operators, they are linear, Hermitian operators, right? So linear means if we act with H on the psi x0, right, what it will give you is it will skip the constant and will go directly to the eigenvalue, right? Oh, sorry, eigenfunction, right? F and X. And what it will produce, well, according to this equation, it will produce E n phi n, right? So it will multiply essentially constant. So what you get at the end is Uh, you get the same sum, but the coefficients are modified now, right? It's very simple. You had, a, you, you had initially expansion, and all you need is to change the coefficient in that expansion, and you have, uh, you have your action of the operator on the function. Now, it becomes even more useful when we're dealing with such Things like exponent, logarithm, or cosine of operator doesn't really matter what function, as long as it's differentiable, it has a Taylor series expansion. And what does that mean? That you can express the, any function of operator as just a linear combination, maybe potentially infinite linear combination, of uh, well polynomial terms, right? So of the a into the or operator in power n, right? Now when a square acts on the or I'd say, in this case, to be specific, when we do h square that acts on the phi n of x, what do we get? Well, we act with one h, we get one e, and then we get another h, then we get another e, right? So we get e squared. Nice and easy, right? So then you can think, all right, so if we have linear combination, that will be pretty much the same for every term, right? Let's just consider one term for simplicity. And uh, if we have exponent of h, let's just skip the, all the constants before to make it simple. Exponent of h acting on phi n of x, right? What do we get? We get all these terms acting on this guy, and every single term will produce the e's in the corresponding power. So we will get 1 plus e n 
plus e n squared divided by 2 plus e n third divided by 6 plus so on and so forth. Right? Multiply by phi n x. Do you follow? Okay. Good. So then, all we need is just to put it back into the exponent, right? Form, because exponential form, because this, uh, this is the same as Taylor series, but now we have numbers instead of operators, right? So even better, we can, we can write it as this. Right? So that's the answer. Okay? And this is good because now we can do this to every term of this expansion. Right? So, and if we put everything together, it's minus i h t divided by h bar acting on the psi x zero, then, then we'll have sum over c n s every single term, uh, the Hamiltonian acting on the eigenfunctions of the h uh, will be giving us ENT and then Fn x, right? And this is our answer, psi x t, well, essentially written in the in the form where we have an expansion over the eigenfunctions, right? That's why eigenfunctions are so fun to work with, right? Because the exponent of the operator acting on them the same way as you would exponentiate the numbers, right? The caveat here is that you need to know phi n and the ens, right? So you need to solve the time independent Schrodinger equation to be able to do what I just did, right? But potentially, potentially, why time dependent Schrodinger equation is more kind of general is that the solution of time independent Schrodinger equation is the eigenvalue, uh, like eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, right? They are, we, we are quite strict when we solve this problem, right? So particle in the box, we have a specific phi n's and specific e n's, right? So for particle in the box, uh, let me just remind you, particle in the box, uh, we have uh, phi n x, which is square root of 2 divided by L, sine n pi x divided by L, right? And then e n's are n pi h bar divided by, no square divided by uh, 2ma ml squared, right? So we have this strictly defined by eigenvalue problem, okay? By this eigenvalue problem. Now for the time dependent on your equation, we can take any psi we want, any psi. Say we can, with only condition is that psi x zero will be uh, L square normalizable, right? Uh, from L2 space. So what is L2 space? So L2 space is a space of functions, uh, so in this case one dimensional functions, where psi x of zero square integral for the whole space. So if you have more than one variable, then you need to integrate all of them, all space variables, not the time one. This is also sometimes called Hilbert space? Uh, well, Hilbert space is more general. Okay. This is a one example of the Hilbert spaces, right? So Hilbert space by definition is a linear, uh, infinite dimensional space with defined norm, right? So what does that mean? That means, let's just discuss that. So you guys familiar with the vector spaces, right? Linear vector spaces with vectors and uh, 
quantum, like when you're familiar with the linear vector spaces, quantum mechanics becomes very simple and straightforward. Because, well, we don't have many distinctions actually related to going from the, uh, well, few distinctions maybe, but not many, uh, going from the finite dimensional vector space to uh, infinite dimensional functional space, right? The analogies are all over the place. So linear space, right? What, what are the inhabitants of the linear space? Uh, vectors, right? Vectors and uh, constants, right? Lambdas, say constants. And so, what linear space is is a set where you also have mm, kind of few operations. The operations are v plus summation, right? That is, you familiar with summation, right? Yes? No? Okay. Could you could you speak up, please? It's commutative, right? And it's also associative. So this is uh, the same as this. And then if you have Right. Also, we have a multiplication by a constant. So what, what is this all I'm writing here? Uh, why is this a kind of interesting condition? Uh, it's interesting because you have any two vectors in the space. You sum them together and you're getting not something but something that lives in the same space, right? So it's not, it's not bringing you outside. So if you say, uh, just to make a point that it's not very uh, simple, is that if you take uh, all, the num all the real numbers from 0 to 1, right? So in the range from 0 to 1, then if you start summing them, you quickly well, run out of the space. But if you will multiply them, onto each other, then you will stay within, the sub, uh, within that space, okay? So in that sense, uh, with respect to multiplication, right, so this, in algebra, they actually don't, well, they, they call everything multiplication, right? So they say, okay, there is, there is this symbol, multipli like some operation, and if you have uh, elements from this, A and B, say, it will be C, and C will be in the same, it's like a group. Right, so group, uh, it's a, another algebraic uh, construction where you have two elements, you multiply them, and you get the third element which is still in the group. Right? Here, the group multiplication is summation, and it's commutative group, and it's called abelian sometimes, and also associative, uh, which is not always so true, uh, but in this case it is. Now, you also have true multiplication by a constant, and that also gives you an element that is in the linear space, let's call it L. So in L, you know, this is an L, and this is an L, right? In the condition, of course, that these guys are all in L. Okay, so you don't get outside of L by doing this. Okay, now uh, note that this uh, idea of the scalar product, right, or dot product, hasn't been mentioned yet, okay? So this is something that comes on top of the linear uh, space. Not every linear space have a scalar or dot product. So in a general uh, linear space, you cannot multiply V with, say, W to get, uh, to get some number, oh, lambda, right? You don't have that operation. But in the Hilbert space that we work uh, we have that operation, and uh, it is then needs to be defined somehow. So if we work with the Hilbert, uh, sorry, the Euclidean space of say the the best example would be vectors in the this this board is linear space, right? So it has vectors. I can draw vectors, 
and uh, it has numbers. I can multiply this. Like any vector can be expanded then in basis of vectors, and uh, then I can also build a scalar product. Scalar product will be just v x star. If we wanna uh, well work with the complex numbers, we 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 need to have uh, uh, conjugation of uh, left element, right? Dy. This is our lambda, right? This is our definition of the scalar product. By the way, do you know why do we need this uh, conjugation? Because you, you want your output to be real. Right, and. and well, wait, wait, wait. So you're saying that any, any element, any two vectors should give you a scalar product which is real? Yes. Why, why, do you want to, why would you want that? We want to define a norm, like a magnitude. And what would a complex magnitude mean? I think it's just... That's right. But then, but then, yes, you're right. Just only correction is that you want this guy to be real. The same vector. Because two different vectors, scalar product can be imaginary or can have imaginary component. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the length, length is defined, it's just the geometric quantity, right? Length. How do you define length in the abstract space? Well, with vectors is just uh, yeah, length, uh, the norm of V is length, and it's a square root of uh, V, V, right? That's how we define length, and now, you can see that if you have a scalar product, that's all you need to define lengths, to define actually then uh, also angles between objects like functions. Because uh, functions now can be put, the only thing you need to define is a scalar product. And uh, all the scalar product for the functions uh, in this L square integrable space, it's defined if you have two f and g, say, Right, so this is a scalar product, and let's use Dirac notation. Right, so which is which has nice property that you don't uh, well, need to write the argument, or argument could be anything. Yeah. And sorry, so you said the, the Hilbert space is an additional structure from L two, but so, and then I, I didn't catch what, which part was the additional structure. Well, the way you define the scalar product, right? Define the norm. And so L2 doesn't have the norm? Or it's no, it is defined in a specific way. Okay. Okay. So, because one, uh, alternative ways to define scalar product can be, well, say, I think you can, if you work in some space between, like, just define everything. Oh, from minus infinity plus infinity. You can uh, potentially take a max of the function uh, in, in the whole space from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that can also serve as a, as a norm. Okay, so you can define the norm that way or you can define norm uh, with the integral like this but then you take, a, you take, say, just an absolute value, right? So that's another definition of the norm. And uh, all these definitions, they essentially will define the length, uh, the length of the vector in a different way, right? But they all will be positive because the only definition for the norm or for the length is that this should be real and positive or equal to zero, and it's only equal to zero when these guys are zero. Right vectors, but for any other vector, it should be positive number. So you define in in this case a functional. The functional is a map between the functions and numbers, right? That will produce well, will satisfy this uh, requirement, right? And then you are not restricted to do it in a, in a many different ways. So that's why there are different Hilbert spaces, right? 
and L square or L2, L square integrable functions, uh, they, they have this square here because psi itself, well, psi itself doesn't have meaning. The absolute value would have probably more meaning, but just uh, here, I guess, I will need to resort to just the postulate. This is, this is how it is, right? So cannot, uh, I guess, dwell more into that. Uh, this is how, m that's how math meets what we see in reality, right? Or after all, I think uh, in general we we only can test quantum mechanics that it produces the right uh, answers in, and it it has a kind of it is consistent language, consistent formalism, right? No one can observe psi. Psi is some kind of ephemeric object that no one can probe, no one can uh, see. It's only the properties that it gives, right? So, but that's good for practical purposes, and uh, that's why, I guess, it's so hard to understand quantum mechanics because no one can touch or feel the psi quantity, right? It's somewhere there in the uh, first in the in imagination of Schrodinger, and then, but it. It is so useful, right? So because all the properties then can be obtained from psi, all right? So now we have this Hilbert space, <coughs> and the nice thing is we're going. Let's let's talk a little bit about measurement. It's very important uh, since it connects us to experiment uh, and uh, to justification of the quantum mechanics, right? So what do you know about measurement? Mm -hmm. You basically collapse the wave function, and mm -hmm. you're going to get a value when you do measurement. And that value corresponds to an eigenvalue of the operator for what you're, say, you're measuring angular momentum. Um, and if you decompose the wave function into the eigenfunctions of angular momentum, the value that you measure is going to be a coefficient, and if the wave function now collapses to the corresponding eigenfunction of that coefficient you measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone concurs? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, that's pretty much, yeah, all true. So we have, whenever we talk about property, we, we have an operator in mind, and that operator necessarily Linear and Hermitian and Hermitian operators, they have, <coughs> I'll just say O, the operator that corresponds to observable. I just got to run to the bathroom. Uh, sure. Uh, by the way, uh, since we went over one hour, why don't we take a five minute break? And, oh, that's uh, even yeah, better. Yeah, we'll <laughs> resume after. Okay. Observable quantity. Right, so it has a, a set of eigenfunctions, right? And uh, the part where, to me at least, uh, the postulate part comes in is that we can prove that every Hermitian operator, and Hermitian means uh, that O and O self, uh, it's self adjoint. And I don't want to go into the details, uh, the difference between the Hermitian and self-adjoint, but we will consider them kind of uh, equivalent notions, right? Uh, say if we have a Hermitian operator, then it's easy to prove that uh, any Hermitian operator has real eigen uh, values, right? For that, all you do, do you remember the proof? Did you see the proof? No. Okay, so it's it's actually very simple. So in the bracket notation, if you have uh, operator O acting on G and the F and G, they are both uh, some kind of well, I guess we we can take F uh, N right, the same eigen uh, function, 
right? So O acts on Fn, and since it's a Hermitian, then O dagger acts on Fn, Fn, right? So this guy gives you mm, Fn, lambda n Fn, and this is, since this is a constant, this is lambda n Fn, Fn, and here, uh, this guy gives us uh, well, O dagger is the same as O, so you have O Fn, Fn, so O again acts on Fn, gives us lambda n Fn, Fn, and then, <coughs> but taking lambda out of the bra part, it gives us lambda n conjugate, Fn, Fn, right? So we have equal sign here. These are also equal. And these guys are non-zero. So we can just cross them off. And lambda n equals to lambda n conjugated. So that means there is no imaginary part of lambda. Otherwise, they will be different. So you can see that any Hermitian operator has a real eigenvalues. But what, uh, as I was saying, the postulate part is that any observable quantity, it also should have a Hermitian operator that has a complete set of these functions. All right, so the completeness is very important for the following reason. First of all, everyone knows what completeness is of the function? You can start set. any other function. That's right. So it's, it's the same as uh, with vectors, say, uh, any, any vector on this blackboard I can represent as, uh, well, essentially basis vectors of x and y, or I can rotate that system and it can be this, this x prime and y prime. Uh, essentially, there, is, there, there are these basis vectors that can represent any vector, right? So this is easy with vectors. Well, or maybe not sometimes so easy because if you have a vector that uh, looks out from the board, right, goes like this, then you cannot represent it with a 2D subspace. But if you rotate your 2D subspace, you can still incorporate that vector, right? But if you have three vectors and four, and some of them are looking out, uh, and uh, it's not necessarily you can represent them all, right? Now, <laughs> here, these functions are complete, uh, form the complete set. That's why you can represent any function as linear combination of those. And uh, this is very important for the measurement property uh, because if you have, say, phi x, and you indeed can represent it as a cn f n x, where the coefficients, like with vectors, uh, the coefficients are obtained by making a scalar product or so dot product, right? So here it's the phi with f n, right? the integral dx, uh, now actually that's be correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these coefficients, uh, they define this way, and you can easily obtain this once you know the fn functions and the functions you're expanding, right? So then if you measure property corresponding to O, you, that measurement process collapses phi to function fn, and the measurement device gives you lambda n as a kind of outcome, right, with probability cn squared, okay? Now, there's a completeness relation coming into play here because uh, if you sum all the coefficients, uh, they will give you one. And that can be seen uh, just uh, from uh, a, well, simply if we write down this, uh, this sum over n, sum cn, cn, right? So this guy is this quantity, and this guy is the conjugated quantity. So then it becomes uh, 
phi fn phi n phi and then you have a sum over n right is that a, a tensor product in the middle no, no, it's just a, it's just a product of uh, what is this? Uh, I define this. Okay, this this is just easy to write this way, but oh, okay. right? But this is like this, and there's a multiplication in between, okay, yes, right? So there are no tensor products. So uh, for now, they will appear when we start talking about uh, at least two dimensions, right? So then it's a nice construction uh, to to build the. Uh, Hamiltonians and the matrices of operators for well, two variables. You you make a tensor tensor product of matrices uh, for one variable times uh, matrices for another variable, and you, you use tensor contraction, not contraction but multiplication, Kronecker tensor multiplication. All right. So here it's uh, just uh, just this that comes out of the definition what C n is. So this is a C n and this is C n star. Uh, all you do is you kind of uh, uh, permute them, right? But uh, now, how this works is that uh, this essentially is the phi, phi, because this forms a resolution of identity and. Uh, Uh, can be kind of contracted, right? So <coughs> um, I just don't obviously see how you get from from the, here to here. Because I mean, I, I think of those the, the products there as like integrals. Mm -hmm. Aren't you kind of pulling functions in between the two integrals? These are two integrals. That's right. The okay. The way to See this okay, so d one integral is dx uh, say phi f and x phi x another integral is dx prime phi and x prime. Prime and then it should be conjugated, right? So then you can say that this one is dx dx prime double integral summation over n uh, summation over n f n x star f n prime and then you have phi x phi x prime star right I'm just, sorry, this I'm is sorry. all this is all just formal right oh because there are different variables so we can pull them in between each other yeah I it's like yeah so it's just different summations right oh, okay. so one integral uh, well goes over one variable and another integral goes over another variable and those int uh, those variables are not connected right yes. so uh, now, I guess the the part which is somewhat uh, now less trivial is that uh, this sum is a delta x minus x prime, okay, and then this is a and that's just Dirac delta, yeah. uh, right? So then you have dx dx prime Dirac delta x minus x prime. Fx, fx prime, and so by definition, if we now integrate dx prime with Dirac delta and this variable, right? Those are the only three quantity that are involving x prime. Then we will be left with dx, phi x, and then the result of this integration will be phi but now with x instead of x prime, right, star. And this is a phi, phi. And presumably we have a normalized wave function, right? So this is one, right? But the completeness 
uh, completeness of a set of functions, they can be, it can be thought as the fact that this sum should always give us Dirac delta function. Or it can be also thought that any function, if you expand it and the coefficients are summed together, this is, I think, called Percival equality, that if you take any function from functional space, form these coefficients over the set that you're considering, and then the, take an absolute square, then the sum of the absolute square should be equal to 1. If they are not equal to 1, that means you don't have enough functions in this subset to represent whatever function you are dealing with, okay? So the completeness can be uh, identically reformulated in uh, what? Oh, in a few ways. Uh, one is that the, all the sum of the coefficients will be one. Another is that the sum over functions, like uh, the, this product, uh, will be a delta function. And, uh, and that all leads to the fact that you're going to get, yeah, one essentially, if you sum the coefficients. Now, <coughs> now, there are two cases possible from this general from this general explanation. What happens during measurement? Uh, the two cases are that uh, your function is not one of the eigenfunctions, right? And then it can be expanded, but the coefficients will be all smaller than one, right? Uh, I guess one example which you may have seen for a particle in a box uh, you can actually from 0 to L you can uh, what usually put as an exam problem uh, you can take a parabola uh, equation would be x multiplied by x uh, x minus L so that it is uh, 0 at 0 and at L, right? This quadratic function uh, with some normalization constant to make it normalized, right? And this function is not a sine function, right, clearly. But it's pretty darn close to a uh, sine of uh, with n equals 1, OK? So the overlap of this function with the first particle in the box function is like 0.9 maybe 8 or maybe 9, 9. So 99%, 98%, you can calculate the integral and say, uh, see for yourself. Uh, and that, but still, there are some other coefficients for the second and third and so on, right? So it's not an eigenfunction. That means if you measure the energy of the particle in the box that is built as a, well, the function which is parabolic, not the eigenfunction, then you get, well, 99% of the results will be the first eigen, uh, collapse into the first eigenfunction, and then there will be something residual from the other uh, terms. So what would you be measuring in that case? Energy, say. Because in order to collapse to eigenfunctions uh, which are sine functions here, right, those are eigenfunctions of energy, uh, or Hamiltonian of the system, right? So then you would need to measure energy to collapse to these functions. So the energy that the particle would have if the wave function was a parabola? Yeah. So you construct a system with any function that is normalized, right? And it's L square integrable. Those are the only conditions to have a system in that wave function, in that state, all right? So state can be anything. It can be eigenfunction or can not, uh, it can be not eigenfunctions, it can be anything, right? As long as it's normalizable, continuous, and. Uh, would, so would that be your initial conditions, if you will? That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that will be my initial condition. I prepare a system in that state, and then at the same time I measure what's the energy. And the result of that measurement will be, uh, well, 99% of the cases, oh, like every time I measure, I collapse, right? So how do I avoid that? Well, I prepare a million systems, million parabolas like this, right? million parabolas, just a big number, right? And then I start measuring them all at the same time, at zero time. So I measure them all, and uh, once I measure one system, of course I don't touch it anymore because it already collapsed, so it's already spoiled. So I'm not interested in it anymore. So I don't want uh, well, to measure something that I already measured. Because the, well, kind of the second measurement 
well, will not give me a new result. It will, once you collapse to the eigenstate of the energy, you measure energy again, well, you're already in that eigenstate, so it, it will keep producing the same result, right? So the 99%, say, will give you E1 for this parabola, and then there are a few, like one other percent will be spread out over other states, other energies, right? So that's a kind of a case where your function is a superposition of the eigenstates of the operator you are measuring. And then, of course, there is a case when you, your function is just an eigenstate, one of the eigenstates, right? And then when you measure, you get with certainty the eigenvalue that associated with that eigenfunction, okay? So in that sense, it's very simple when you measure eigenfunction of the operator. All right, we talked about that, and uh, now operators that correspond to the different properties, they may commute or may not commute. Okay, so do you remember anything about commutation relations? If they do commute, you can measure both of those uh, quantities at the same time. Why? This is correct. Okay, the more rigorous statement will be if operators commute, I, I wrote two operators, right? O1 and O2. Right, if operators commute, then you can choose the set of their eigenfunctions, which will be the same for both operators, okay? that you can choose is very crucial. And I'll return to that in a moment. Now, before we go into the details of this, everyone is uh, comfortable with commutation, like what commutation is, right? So you have O1, O2, this is a commutator, minus O2, O1, right? So you essentially you're comparing, if they act on some function f, you're comparing of the result of O1 first on, o, on F and then O2 or vice versa, right? And the operations even in like in normal life, they don't commute, right? So if you, one of my examples, if you uh, cook something, you wash vegetables and put them in a soup, but not the other way around, right? So you don't boil them and then wash. So these operations do not commute and um, Operators in math as well don't commute uh, generally. X and P, those are the common examples. <clears throat> now, there is a theorem uh, that says that if two operators commute, and only in this case, then you can find a common set of eigenfunctions. That means if this is true, then, uh, you can prove both ways that from this follows that uh, GMs can be um, made equal to some maybe constant F, M, right? Where GMs are the eigenfunctions of the O2 and F functions are eigenfunctions of uh, O1, right? Have you seen the proof of that theorem? Not, not really. Okay, so that's very simple proof. Well, it's both ways, so you can easily show that if uh, they have the same eigenfunctions, then they commute, and that part this way, it's easy to show by simply expanding f in the eigenfunctions of uh, O1 and O2, right? So if f is a sum over Cn and say it's a sum over Fn and Fn are the both eigenfunctions of O1, O2, then all you get when you apply this commutator on F, you get here 
the corresponding eigenvalues c n say lambda n and then theta n right with f n and in this direction you uh, for for this part you also get c n because operators do not act on the coefficients right and then you have the same eigen uh, values from both right so you have two identical sums you see that right so if you can expand your arbitrary function in a set which is the same for O1 and O2 and that set I call Fn right so then O1 acting on this guy will produce lambdas and then O2 will produce thetas is, is that Fn sort of near the bottom the same as the Fn in the top left hand corner yeah and also well, okay, so this is the first proof, this is the second. So here I'm showing, number one, that if oh. the g's are up to the constant, the same as yeah. fm, right? So this constant I can put in theta, right? So and forget about it. Then when you act with O1 to this linear combination, and then with O2, or you act with uh, O2, then O1, Every time what you do by acting the wave operator, you are producing an, uh, just an eigenvalue in front of the function, right? And so then you get two identical sums. So then they necessarily zero. So that means the commutator acting on any function, right, then will produce zero. That means commutator is identical zero. Uh, moving to the second part of this theorem if two, uh, if two operators commute that's a little bit more challenging <coughs> but all right so again there will be two parts one is we assume that there are no degenerate eigenvalues that means what does that mean so that say on O1 uh, if you have fn equals to lambda n fn there is no fn prime then when o1 acts on the fn prime it gives the same gives the same lambda n right so this is a degenerate case we will consider next okay this is a second uh, like a 2b this will be a 2b and then 2a is when you don't have that okay so then if you don't have that what we will consider is uh, O2, O1 acting on some Fn, then it gives us lambda and O2 Fn, right? O1 first acts on Fn and gives us lambda n. Lambda n can be taken outside what we have is this right now this is some function uh, we don't know what function it is right now simply because it's just the operator acting on a function but now by the condition that O2 and O1 they commute then this should be equivalent to O1 O2 acting on Fn right well we just Turn them. Uh, okay, so then this is a function and this is a function and they are the same. Right? So that what does this uh, mean is that O1 acting on that new function O2 times Fn uh, gives us lambda n. So that means that this guy, Fn, let's call it Fn prime, it's an eigenfunction of O1 operator with lambda n but by the condition that there are no degeneracies we must state that O2 Fn is with some constant Fn there is no other function in O1 set that will give us lambda n we said this this is a this de degenerate condition we uh, we assume that it's not true so there is no other function 
but fn that gives us lambda n when O1 o acts on it, right? And it seems like we found the function that satisfies that condition. So then, necessarily, that function will be this, this guy, O2 times fn. There will be some constant times fn. So it's essentially fn, right? And what do we have here is that O2 and acting on fn gives you some constant fn. That means fn is also an eigenfunction of the O2, right? So we proved the non-degenerate case. Uh, with degeneracy, it's a little bit uh, different, but still doable. <coughs> the way we do it is the following. We now say, all right, we have a lambda n. And we have a set of functions. Uh, oh, let's let's just uh, say there is one lambda for which we have a set of functions. Uh, we call them. Just don't want to put superscripts and subscripts, uh, but just to avoid confusion with subscripts before. Uh, say we fix some n, and there is a lambda for it, and we have a set of functions f i's. So that O1, when it acts on Fi's, produce lambda Fi, right? They all give the same lambda. Then we take a linear combination of them, Ci, Fi. Right? And if we have linear combination of them, O1 will still produce lambda linear combination of these functions because each one of them will produce uh, each one of them will produce lambda so we take lambda out okay now we will uh, follow the same logic o2 o1 on this linear combination right it will be o2 lambda uh, sum ci fi uh, and then this is equal because O2 and O1 commute to O1, O2. And then we have a linear combination, CI, FI, uh, F, I superscript, right? So we have this, we have this, and this is lambda O2. Right? So here we get this O2 acting on this linear combination. And then here's the same. So O1 acting on this new function, which is O2 linear combination, gives us lambda. And then O2 acting on the linear combination. Okay? So the same as the non-degenerate case. Now, with the only difference is that lambda, lambda, corresponds to uh, corresponds to several functions to subspace essentially, right? So, a simple way to think about it is that say we have three-dimensional space, right? And O1, uh, the eigenvectors for O1 operator is x, y, and every possible rotation of x, y, right? So there is a z that has one eigenvalue, and that xy subspace has all, uh, all the same right eigenvalues. Now, <coughs> when O2 act on the, this linear combination, what, what it means is that it doesn't actually move us outside of the subspace uh, corresponding to lambda. So what this means is that we can write O2 acting on this linear subspace as d i f i, right? So we just got different coefficients, but we're still in that subspace, OK? But then all we need is uh, we can rotate. We can choose the initial c's so that 
the O2 will act on our initial C's so that this will be uh, well, essentially some kind of uh, alpha again, some CIFI. So we essentially, when we, when we do this and we see that DIs are different from CIs, all we need to do is rotate initial CIs so that would not happen. Okay, we have a, we have a choice in these coefficients because all these FI functions, when O1 acts on them, will produce alpha and no matter what coefficients we take. So then to make this linear combination and eigenfunctions for O2, we need to choose the CIs properly. So that when O2 acts and rotate within that subspace, it will rotate so that the, uh, the rotation will be trivial. It's just multiplication by some phase constant, okay? So that kind of com completes the proof that even in the degenerate case, you can just find the coefficients so that the O2 will uh, be an eigenoperator for that linear combination. Will we actually be calculating those coefficients or like an example of that, or will we just use that? Uh, we, 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 we can calculate, and that's probably one of the last examples. Uh, just to illustrate the point, and that's not that difficult, uh, say we consider the kinetic energy and momentum, right? Those are two operators, and uh, one is a square of another, right? Roughly, yeah. multiplied by a constant. Now, they commute because, say, t, is, t operator is p squared divided by 2m, right? So necessarily, t and p commutator will be p squared times p minus p times p squared, right? So it's p cubed minus p cubed. I'll put proportional because there are some constants, right? So, but the result is zero. So they commute. Now, uh, we know that, uh, okay, so p eigenfunctions, uh, say we'll put fn, lambda n, fn. What are they? They are minus ih d over dx. These functions, uh, well, we know that they are plane waves. And then you get the p, uh, h bar, and uh, back ipx, right? Uh, but then for t, for t, we know from the particle in the box problem, because particle in the box Hamiltonian, within that uh, box, it's just the T operator, right? So we can show that the T acting on the cosine, or sine doesn't really matter. What the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you take IPX, plus or minus exponent of minus ipx, that also will be, well, th these functions, they will be an eigenfunctions for t. Why? Because t cares about p squared, not about the p. Right, so we differentiate twice. You can, you can easily see, well, let's say for the concreteness, let's put the plus and that's cosine, right, of px. So if you differentiate d x square cosine px, right? You differentiate cosine once, you get uh, minus sine. And then you differentiate minus sine, you get cosine back, right? So it will be minus p squared, right? Cosine px. So this is eigenfunction, right? But cosine px is not an eigenfunction of uh, momentum operator because d over dx cosine px gives us what uh, minus p sine px right sine versus cosine different functions
Yeah, yeah, they kind of, you can, you can represent cosine as imaginary exponents, right? But the point I'm making here is it's easy to make mistake, uh, the following. Uh, if two operators commute, they must have the same eigenfunctions. That's a, that's a statement that contains mistake. Because here's an example where two operators commute, and I'm showing you this is an eigenfunction for one, but not for another. Right? How do we understand this? I mean, I think of e to the i px as cosine of px and cosine of px plus i sine of px, right? You yeah. Like sure. Here, or or yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Like, we can imagine exponentials and real trigonometric functions are the same. Quantum mechanics? How can this be? Because this is cos, as you said, cosine px plus i sine px, right? So this is different from this. It has the whole i sine thing. Where do, you, where do you put that? Like if you compare this versus this, yes, this part is the same, but this one is not, right? Or if you take this part, it will be the same. It will be eigenfunction of the t, but it's not going to be eigenfunction of p. So how do we well, very it's wrong? Uh, well, as I said, if two operators commute, it doesn't mean that they must have the same eigenfunctions. Okay. You can choose eigenfunctions for two of them to be the same. You can choose. Okay? And you can means that this set of this sort of functions actually will be eigenfunctions for T and P. But these guys, it's wrong linear combination. They are not eigenfunctions for p, but they are eigenfunctions for t. So you always can screw up the linear combination. And that's related to this example I was telling you, right? So O2 acting on the wrong linear combination, it will rotate them to DIFI, and it's not going to be the same function as you started with. Yes. Okay, so here cosine px is a, just a wrong linear combination of functions which are eigenfunctions for t, but they are with, just dif uh, but they are with different eigenvalues uh, for the p. And so the t rotates within that subspace uh, in their own way. Actually, it will produce, uh, yeah, p will produce, co from cosine it will produce sine, and that means it just puts a minus sign here, right? And that's what screws up the whole uh, definition of eigenfunction. All right, so this is non-triviality of that theorem about the commuting variables. Generally, generally, you can always find eigenfunctions, which will be uh, eigenfunctions for both operators. And that's why if you set your system in the eigenstate of, op of, the uh, the eigenstate of two operators, then uh, you can measure, of course, with certainty a property, right? for both. All right, so uh, we have, uh, I think uh, we're done for today, and uh, next time we will finish some of the, uh, probably we'll cover, we, we already covered uh, a lot of basics, and uh, maybe I will derive you the uncertainty principle, just a general um, expression for the variation of the operators uh, which do not commute. Okay, and uh, then we'll move on to the approximate methods. All right? Okay.